Okay. Hello, Logic Class. We are almost done with this big packet on natural deduction proofs in predicate logic, uh, fish style proofs. We have left uh, 46, 47, and uh, completely forgot, but we skipped uh, number 40. Okay, uh, so after this video, we will be done. And um, this is actually my second time recording this video because um, I recorded an extremely long and sort of like slightly crappy uh, explanation of this proof number 46 and I was so like dissatisfied with it that I uh, just decided to just do it all over again. So here we go. Mm, expect some maybe weird continuity errors. Uh, I'm gonna redo 46 but I thought my explanation of uh, 47 and 40 were sort of okay so we're gonna leave those in. Uh, what do I have? What do we have to say about this number 46? Uh, this is the hardest problem in the whole packet I think um, and really um, this is just a follow-up to, to number 45. So 45, I mentioned, uh, was like the hardest problem in the packet. And I think if you watched the, the video I did a couple weeks ago of number 45, you will hear me say something like, this is as hard as it gets or something like that. If you can do this, you can do anything. Um, those two statements might be in kind of conflict with each other. Um, it is as hard as it gets uh, on the fundamental level of learning kind of new sorts of things. Um, it doesn't get any harder, but this problem is harder. Uh, then 45. Um, it's just more 45. It's just, in fact, the exact same proof as number 45, but just uh, longer and more annoying and more tedious. So, um, if you are 100% mastered in number 45, then uh, you don't even really need to do 46. You're not gonna, you're not gonna really learn anything from doing number 46. And you're just gonna get some more practice. So, that's really the whole goal of 46. Is just, uh, can you, can you practice? Did you really learn 30, 45? So, my recommendation to you is. If you did 45 uh, all by yourself, uh, completely correctly, that's pretty much amazing, I think. I'm extremely impressed. Um, you should watch my video on that topic and uh, at like, you know, five times speed or something, skipping around. And if I did exactly what you did and you get it, congratulations, do 46, call it a day. Uh, if you, which is probably true for more like 80% of you, uh, didn't get 45, tried it really hard, maybe got half of it then got stuck, then watched my video, then you either sort of understood it or didn't. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, you should do it all over again by yourself. So before you try, you have no business trying number 46 until you really can do 45, that's my opinion. Uh, so uh, by that I mean you should, you know, uh, wait until it's been four or five days since you've seen that number 45 video. Uh, try the whole problem again all by yourself, sort of alone in a room with a pencil in your own brain. If you can do it, uh, then go try 46, uh, and this is sort of uh, just solidify your knowledge by forcing your, your brain to, to go over the entire thing all over again in, a envi in an environment that's slightly different enough that, uh, that you're not really just memorizing uh, what's going on. Alright, uh, without further ado, let's do this problem. It's going to take us like, you know, forever, like 40 minutes or something outrageous like that. And uh, it's a biconditional, so really it's two proofs. Uh, two separate proofs, and I, I can't fit them both on the board at once, so I'll do sort of one half and then erase and then do the other half. Um, one of the directions is, is easy, that's going from left to right, and the other one is, is kind of hard. So we have two options now. We can sort of start immediately and just sort of let our uh, sort of Fitch style proof savant skills just carry the day, or we can sort of think deeply about what's going on here. Uh, in the previous video, I mumbled for a really long time about. Uh, some way to interpret this. So, okay, you know, <clears throat> here we have um, two unary predicates which don't appear to have anything to do with each other and, uh, well, P uh, you could interpret as uh, is pretty, Q maybe uh, is quiet. Uh, and so what the hell is this saying? Well, if you repeat this over and over again to yourself, you know, five times or more, you might be able to extract some sort of weird meaning out of this, but it's pretty difficult to do. Uh, let's try. Um, there exists, what does the left hand side of this uh, proposition say? There exists a y such that for all x, uh, not p of x or q of y. Okay, so uh, there is some y such that for every x, x is not pretty or y is quiet. Well, okay, um, let's uh, allow ourselves, since this is all just informal uh, anyway, uh, you know, the proof itself is going to, 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 to speak for itself and it's going to be a precise uh, syntactic object which fully justifies what's going on, 
But uh, there's an entire different uh, logic, uh, sort of the logic of discovery, the logic of coming, how to know what to, to, to do in the proof, um, uh, to, to come up with uh, the steps that one should, should make. Uh, and uh, so let's permit ourselves the flexibility to like mess around a little bit because what is not P or Q? Well, back in the first week of school we saw that the propositional logic uh, equivalent for not P or Q is um, P of X arrow uh, Q of Y. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, P of X arrow Q of Y is a, is a completely um, logically equivalent way of stating uh, what's here in the parentheses. So perhaps that's kind of easier on our, our little brains to, to say it that way. Uh, there exists some y such that for all x, if x is pretty, then y is quiet. So uh, what's going on here? There's some special object, object, person, some special person y. And this special person y has this certain desirable property. And here's the desirable property that this y has. For every single person in the entire world, if that person is pretty, then Y gets quiet. So Y is a person who becomes quiet around uh, pretty people or something like that. And uh, Y may or may not be quiet if X is not pretty, uh, but if X is pretty, then Y definitely is quiet. Okay, that's, what's, that's what the left-hand side asserts. Okay, what does the right-hand side assert? Well, it's a negation, first of all, so that's kind of annoying. So, um, taking off the negation for a minute, uh, here's what this says. This says, uh, for every y, there exists an x, such that x is pretty and y is not quiet. In other words, the right-hand side, without the negation, asserts just, just exactly the opposite of what we just talked about, right? On the left-hand side, we said there's, some, there's some y with some special property such that around any pretty person, y gets quiet. But on the right-hand side, without the negation, it says that, in fact, there is no such person. Because for every y... Uh, well, they don't have that property. And what does it mean to not have that property? It means that for any Y that you give me that you think is one of these people that gets quiet around every pretty person, in fact, for any one of these uh, Ys that you suggest, uh, there is always some person who is pretty and yet Y is not quiet. Okay, I'm straining pretty hard to, to extract some meaning out of this, but I think it just... It just, uh, it sort of works, right? And so uh, what I'm saying now is the negation of that. In other words, yo, if there exists some special person Y who gets quiet around every pretty person, then it's not true that every Y that you suggest fails to have this property. That's pretty hard. Um, okay, of course, where did I come up with such a ridiculous, uh, I invented this problem. Uh, where did I come up with such a ridiculous uh, proposition in the first place, which is supposedly some kind of tautology? Here's what I didn't mention in the previous video, but I'm going to mention now. For some reason, I thought this was maybe a bad thing to say, but I've changed my mind completely, and I now think it's a good thing to say. Uh, maybe you already see immediately how I came up with this problem and how one could construct these problems uh, oneself if you were a logic teacher. Well, you just, like, apply the freaking De Morgan Law, right? I mean, the De Morgan Law says take this second half, right? What can we do? We distribute the negation through, and we know, because we've proved it, uh, for all y, sorry, um, when you factor the negation uh, through, it flips the quantifier. So this becomes, there exists a y, such that not there exists an x, uh, p of x, uh, and not q of y. This is not the proof. This is me just doing kind of scratch work. Uh, well, what next? Well, I apply another De Morgan law, which says that when you factor the negation in, you flip the quantifier. And so we get this. And finally, we factor the negation in again, and you get there exists a y such that for all x, uh, and this becomes, now via the propositional logic version of the De Morgan laws, um, not p of x, and that and becomes an or, and then you get not, not, so this becomes QY. Okay, so, and that's of course exactly what we got on the left. In other words, if you kind of don't like fixed style proofs, and I don't totally blame you, then this is proof that this whole thing is just extremely annoying and a total waste of time, and sucks, and uh, you know, this class sucks, and you hate me, and all that other kind of stuff. Because, after all, um, instead of doing the 45-minute proof that I'm about to start, which is extremely difficult, can't I just 
uh, apply the De Morgan's laws, and uh, you know, in about one minute, I have in fact shown that these two are logically equivalent to each other via application of the De Morgan's laws. And if that's how you feel, I fully respect you. And of course, you're exactly right. Uh, if I was sort of put on the spot to do this, this is exactly what I would do. Uh, and now I'm completely satisfied, and there's no real reason to do this proof, uh, you might say. Uh, okay, um, now, what about the De Morgan laws themselves? They have been proven already by us, that was proof 42 and 43. Um, Uh, via Fitch style proofs. And those proofs were kind of hard. Um, but uh, in a, if we were pursuing, and we're not, a system in which we tried to sort of make maximum use of previously proved theorems, then yeah, for sure the way to go would be to prove the De Morgan's laws once and for all and then just kind of use them. So, okay, we're not pursuing that system partially because I want to show how this system can sort of work even to prove, you know, these more complicated things. Um, but anyway, uh, let's keep the De Morgan's laws kind of in the back of our mind uh, and, and use them as kind of a useful guide or something like that for, for what to do next. Okay, uh, without further ado, we begin. Hopefully that was uh, kind of worth it, and this will come up again in a minute. Uh, so uh, let's go. We start the proof. Uh, it's a, well, it's a biconditional, so therefore I add in this kind of extra line here, and now I'm going to... Um, now I'm going to do it. So I'm going to go, uh, there exists a y, such that for all x, not um, p of x or q of y, and what I hope to get, you know, way down here, is um, this. Not for all y, there exists an x, um, p of x, uh, and not q of y. Okay, and that will be half the proof. Oh yeah, this is what I call the easy half. Uh, it's because uh, I get a big head start, right? Uh, what should I do right now? Well, it's just clear exactly what to do. Because um, the uh, main connective of this sentence is a negation. There's really only one good way to prove a negation. It's proof by contradiction. So we go, um, or, you know, negation intro, if you're being super technical, about this. So I begin. Uh, what should I do? I should uh, suppose, for all y, there exists an x. Uh, p of x and not q of y, and uh, hope for a uh, bottom, and then I will be done. Okay, uh, where am I going to get that bottom from? Well, uh, lines one and two are just contradictory with each other, and this is exactly what I was saying a couple of minutes ago. <coughs> Line one asserts the existence of this special person who, if anyone is pretty at all, that person Y gets quiet. But line two asserts that there is no such person. Because for any Y whatsoever, there's always some X which is pretty and yet Y is not quiet. And so it's, I think, now to, to be seen that these two are naturally uh, contradicting each other and that's why we're going to get this bottom. Okay, how to proceed though? I have sort of two um, uh, statements, uh, one and two. Well, one uh, I can't make any progress without, without uh, doing something with line one. Line one asserts the existence of some person. Think of that as like a powerful uh, piece of knowledge. There's some person Y, says line one, who exists with some special property. And so um, the only way I can use line one is to temporarily give that person a name. And uh, so here we're going to do that right now. Um, I'm going to name this person in line one. I'm going to name them uh, B because I, I like to go in kind of uh, alphabetical order from left to right through my proposition. Uh, and, and sort of, sort of uh, why is the object that gets kind of talked about second or something? Of course, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and uh, what's true about this uh, person B? Well, they, they, they are the person that's being discussed in line one. And so what's true about them? For all x, not P of x, or Q of B. Chop. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so what? Um, so, so what about, what, what, so what? Um, well, uh, I now have some very strong sort of statement here. The statement is, in line three, that, uh, everybody, uh, in the whole world, um, you know, if they're pretty, B gets quiet. Okay, <clears throat> but as we've already discussed, uh, line two, uh, kind of contradicts that by saying that, uh, for any person you might suggest, uh, I could find a person who's pretty and B is not quiet, right? and, and that person is not quiet. And so, okay, uh, you know, here it is. 
uh, B is one of the kind of people that's being discussed in line two. So to get this contradiction, I'm going to stick B in uh, for line two. I think that's pretty clear. So uh, I'm going to stick uh, substitute B in for, for Y in the universal statement in line two. What does this give me? It gives me there exists an X such that P of X and not uh, Q of B, cha, cha. And, uh, okay, the justification for this is universal elem 2. All right, um, things are becoming even more clear now, I think, uh, because 3 and 4 are seen to be even more obviously uh, contradictory. 3 says, uh, for any person in the entire world who's pretty, B gets quiet. And yet 4 says there exists a person that's pretty and then B doesn't get quiet. So here it's now down to the level of sort of a, a one variable uh, situation, and uh, well, okay, there's only one good way to proceed, that is, uh, line 4 is talking about some particular person, X, so we will now name that person. So we start a new subproof in which we say, okay, let the person in line 4 be called A. And uh, so what property does A have? Uh, prop A has the property uh, that um, the, 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 the x is supposed to have in line 4. Okay, and now, uh, sort of sort of what? Um, well, okay, where, where, now, uh, of course, um, I have this statement, right, which is that A is pretty, and yet B is not quiet. But it's line 3 which tells me that for every person, when they're, uh, if they're pretty, B is quiet. Uh, and so, uh, 5 should be seen as contradicting line 3. In other words, just stick A in for line 3, and we get not P of A or Q of B. And the justification uh, for this line is, again, uh, universal elim uh, 3. And now, sort of, here we are, right? Um, you should be feeling pretty good because lines four, 5 and 6 are just obviously contradictory. Line 6 says that either A is pretty or B is quiet, but 5 says no, in fact, A is pretty, but B is not quiet. Okay, so now I just to get a contradiction uh, out of lines 5 and 6, but now this is just pure, uh, this is just pure propositional logic. So uh, how, why, how can these be seen to be contradictory? Well, um, I'm going to do now a proof by cases on line 6. And actually, maybe you want to do this instead. Uh, I don't know which one is, is sort of more intuitive. Um, let's uh, just take a minute and, and kind of uh, break down this uh, conjunction in line 5. Uh, I know um, conjunction uh, E, and this gives me conjunction E lim uh, 5 and uh, conjunction E lim 5. Okay, so now I have these, uh, these two statements that A is pretty and B is not quiet, but each of those are seen to contradict um, line 6. So um, now I do a proof by cases, this is the only sort of thing uh, left to do. And my proof by cases says, okay, well, suppose uh, A is pretty. Uh, no, sorry. Um, sorry, proof by cases on line 6. So it's suppose A is not pretty. Boom. And, uh, okay, well, uh, sorry, but no. Because line 7 says A is pretty. So I get that A is pretty and A is not pretty. That is a contradiction. On the other hand, um, suppose that uh, B is quiet. Uh, the other half of line 6, well, uh, no, because line 8 tells me that B is not quiet. So, bam. So that is also a bottom. And therefore, here in line 15, I just have a contradiction. That's the conclusion of my proof by cases. Uh, let's maybe just kind of notate this now. Uh, what's the justification for this? It's and intro 7, 9. Uh, this is bottom intro 10. This is and intro uh, 12 and 8. Uh, bottom intro 13. And 15 is the result of the proof by cases. I started a proof by cases using line 6. Uh, which said that A is pretty or B is quiet. Sorry, A is not pretty or B is quiet. In line 9, I supposed that it was the left disjunct, which was true, and in uh, subproof 9 through 11, I explored that left disjunct, 
which led to a, a contradiction. And on the other hand, uh, I suppose in lines 12 through 14, that it was uh, Q, uh, th that it was B that was quiet, that also led to a contradiction, therefore contradiction. Okay, and now uh, we say, well, uh, I now just have a contradiction. Why? Uh, here's that kind of uh, special sort of move again, um, in which we say, okay, look, uh, what, what just happened starting in line 5 and ending in line 15? This entire thing here, sha, this entire thing that I just put a big red circle around, uh, was an exploration of line four. Line four asserted the existence of some person. I, um, I uh, used that fact in the only way I can use that fact, which is to um, give that person a temporary name. I temporarily named the X in line four A. In other words, line four says someone exists. I said, okay, let's call that person A for the moment, temporarily. And uh, from that uh, a temporary choice to, to give that, that person in line four the name A, I arrived at a contradiction. And uh, therefore, that contradiction uh, must just follow from line four itself. Uh, I think this is the clearest uh, uh, explanation. So, uh, I say, uh, in line, the justification for line 16 is existential elim. I started with a fact, line 4. In lines 5 through 15, I explored that fact and uh, proved something uh, from it. Uh, in particular, I proved bottom. Therefore, bottom just follows from line 4. Existential, that's an existential elim of line 4. Okay, and, uh, well... Uh, this entire thing was also being done inside of a larger existential Elim proof. And so that is the justification right now for this line 17. It's also an existential Elim. It's an existential Elim of line 1, uh, 3 through 16. In other words, uh, we have a certain statement in line 1 which asserted the existence of a particular person. What we then chose to do, starting just above line 3, is uh, name that person. Uh, and we named that person B. And this entire proof, which I am circling in green, this entire sort of indented subproof, is just the exploration of line 1. Line 1 asserts the existence of some person, and uh, I choose to temporarily name that person B. And uh, as we saw sort of over here, uh, where that led to, to this uh, bottom, now uh, this entire uh, green subproof, um, because I arrived, because because just from temporarily naming uh, that person a B uh, led me to a contradiction in line 16, then I go back out into the main body of the proof in line 17 and assert that that contradiction merely follows from, from one itself, combined with two, of course. Okay, uh, good. So sort of, sort, of, sort of that's what I was doing in lines 3 through 16, you might say. I was exploring uh, the consequences of line 1. Line 1 asserts the existence of a person. I temporarily name the beep. Okay. Hopefully you're getting uh, pretty good at this for now. Bye now. And then, uh, all right, now now we're just done, right? Because this line 18 is negation intro um, 1 through 17. Okay. That was, uh, you know, long and slow and careful, but not particularly hard. I mean, it's getting pretty hard because we have multiple variables, but it's not so difficult. Uh, good. I shall erase all this now, and I'll do the second half, which is, you know, this is what you all sort of came here for. Um, the second half is so hard, uh, and I really, like, barely have enough space for it, so, um, I need to, so I give two pages for this problem, because at least with my level of handwriting, you know, it took me an entire eight and a half by eleven piece of paper just to do, writing very small, just to do the, the, the second half that I'm about to start now, so you really didn't need uh, sort of two pieces of paper for this. And, uh, okay, so I'm going to use this entire board. I think if I write really, really small, I can just 
I can just fit. So, uh, of course, I'm inside this larger uh, biconditional proof, uh, but really, uh, sort of what's left here is the, the other half. So I think I ended with line 18, so this will be line 19. Uh, might as well dent a little bit more. Okay, so this will be line 19, and all right, way down. So what do I start with? I start with uh, not for all y, there exists an x, um, p of x, and not q of y. And somehow, way down here, I shall conclude uh, that uh, there exists a y uh, such that uh, for all x, uh, not p of x uh, or q of y. Okay. So, good. Uh, how am I going to do this? Well, there's only one possible way to do this. Let's, let's, so let's solve this problem with a combination of uh, instinct and, and sort of like uh, deep thinking. Uh, okay, here's deep thought, here's instinct number one. Dude, uh, I need to prove an existential. There's like no way to do that, uh, except by producing a particular individual, and that's just going to be impossible. So the only way to do this is by contradiction. So hopefully that's uh, pretty clear. So, all right, we indent again, and kind of way up here in line 20, I shall assume that there does not exist a y such that for all x, uh, not p of x, or Q of Y. Okay, and uh, what do I hope to get out of this? Answer a contradiction. And that will then enable me to assert not not there exists a Y for all X, not P of X or Q of Y. And then I will uh, remove that uh, double negation uh, to get uh, me to my to my final statement. So hopefully this is pretty clear so far. Going outside in. Uh, okay, how am I going to get that contradiction? Okay, now we are you know sad or something because here I am and uh, what what can I possibly do? I have lines 19 and 20 and together I need to get a contradiction out of lines 19 and 20. How? Well, they're both negations. So neither of these statements is sort of usable as is. In fact, the the sort of destiny of any um, uh, of any negation, uh, any statement whose, whose main connective is a negation, is to be used to prove a uh, contradiction. Uh, and so, uh, I have to sort of uh, say to myself, okay, where is this bottom going to come from? Uh, am I going to prove the opposite of 19, or am I going to prove the opposite of 20? And I think it's pretty clear that I, I can't prove the opposite of 20, right? The opposite of 20 is in fact just the final line of my proof. It is the very fact that I cannot prove this existential um, that is causing me to, to do a proof by contradiction in the first place. I'm doing a proof by contradiction because I do not have the power to generate uh, this, this final line down here from line 19 alone. Uh, and therefore it would be hopeless to think that somehow suddenly now I can prove, uh, I can prove this final line from, nine, nine, from line 19. Therefore, what I should realize is that, yeah, it's the other one, right? I'm going to be proving uh, this for all y statement. Okay, uh, so in other words, the, this contradiction is going to come from uh, for all, let's make sure to write small here, uh, so for all y, uh, there exists an x, uh, p of x and not q of y, uh, and not for all y, there exists an x, uh, p of x, and not q of y. Cha, cha. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, for that to be my contradiction, I first have to prove, uh, for all y, there exists an x, uh, p of x, and not q of y. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this was, I think this was the sort of the first, uh, point in this proof where you had to really make an intelligent um, decision. Uh, where am I going to get this bottom from, uh, you say to yourself? Answer, it has to be this way. This is the only uh, kind of uh, way uh, to do it. The other way doesn't work. 
Uh, all right, if you're convinced by that, then we can sort of proceed, because now I have a, I have a big hint. Um, what is this universal? Uh, what, what, what's my sort of goal now? My goal is to prove this universal. Well, uh, how am I going to do that? Well, uh, there's really one good way to prove a universal, and that is with universal proof. So, over here, uh, I now begin a, a universal proof. And um, I think I'm even writing too big. Um, so let me kind of go even smaller now. Um, what is the universal proof? Well, I have to assume sort of an arbitrary object and then uh, prove this general statement about that arbitrary object. So I'm going to uh, take my arbitrary object B, and what am I going to prove about B? I'm going to prove about B that uh, there exists an x, uh, p of x, and not q of b. In other words, uh, what's b? b is uh, this person who, um, okay, well, there's, there's some pretty person, and yet b is not quiet. And uh, if I can prove from nothing that there exists a pretty person, uh, that if I can prove from nothing that B has the property of uh, being not quiet even though there is a pretty person, uh, then if B has that property, uh, then everybody must have that property because I assumed nothing special about B whatsoever. B was arbitrary. And if everybody has that uh, property, uh, that there is a pretty person and they're still not quiet, uh, then that contradicts, uh, that contradicts my, uh, my line 19. Okay, so, uh, good. Uh, well, how am I, now I'm here. How am I going to do this? How am I, I need to prove this existential statement. Again, I have a moment of clarity, because this is telling me sort of what to do next, and the what to do next is I have to do this again by contradiction. Okay, so I again bring out a whole nother proof by contradiction. Here in line 21, I shall suppose that it's not the case that there exists an x such that uh, p of x uh, and not q of b. And uh, I hope to get down here a contradiction, thus I will conclude not not there exists an x, uh, p of x and not q of b. Okay, so this is the plan. Unfortunately, I have still now uh, not a lot to work with. I'm counting my lines to see how much... I hope I don't run out of space. It would be <coughs> really sad. Um, uh, la, yeah, what do I have now? I need, well, I need to get a contradiction. I need to get a contradiction out of um, sort of three separate lines here, right? I have line 19, I have lines 19, 20, and 21. Uh, and from those three lines, I have to sort of coax uh, some kind of contradiction uh, to, in order to finish off this proof. Okay, and this is now just the hardest moment, right? Right now, <coughs> put a little sort of dot here, uh, just under line 21, and another uh, dot here next to this bottom. And I'll sort of connect these dots because, uh, you know, let it, let it be sort of remembered that um, in, the, in this entire proof, this is the moment where you have to uh, do sort of the hardest uh, step, which is to know what to do now. It's very, very not obvious to know what to do next. Um, I have three propositions only that I can use. All three are negations. Uh, I have to get a contradiction, but, but how? Uh, you need to make a, a big, uh, bold uh, plan now. And, okay, uh, in, proof, in the proof number 45 video, we sort of just talked it out and talked it out and talked it out so many times, and hopefully, I um, made that uh, clear to you, uh, sort of how I came up with it, sort of what to do next. Now, if you're a fish style proof savant, or you're just one of these people with giant brains, you can just keep ten things in there at once and move them all around, perhaps you just kind of know what to do, and maybe you don't even know why, and you don't even need to watch this video. Um, but, uh, you know, for everyone else, I think this is the, this is the hardest uh, moment in the whole proof. So, um, in the first video that was like an hour long, I explained this very poorly, I think, and um, in fact, I even kind of messed it up. And uh, after thinking about this a lot more, I've decided, you know what, um, there's a relatively straightforward way to know uh, what to do next, and that is, um, to sort of dwell heavily on this line 21. Okay, note, of course, that this contradiction is going to involve line 21 somehow in some, in some fundamental way. Um, uh, and, 
Uh, how? What is this line 21 anyway? You might say. Okay, so here, let's do some side calculations. So consider this to be scratch work or in your head work. What is this line 21? Well, it's not. There existed x, uh, p of x, uh, and not q of b. Well, as an aid to sort of completing this proof, let's just use the De Morgan laws on this. What does this say? This says that, uh, well, if I factor the negation through, it's for all x, not uh, p of x uh, and not q of, of b. And then let's factor that um, negation uh, through the conjunction to get um, not p of x uh, or not not, so that becomes q of b. Okay, in other words, this line 21, let's call it 21 star or something like that, is really, in terms of sort of content, fundamentally, a statement that uh, for every sing and even, we could even go one step further, and, uh, well, we can leave it there. Uh, this is saying that for all x, uh, <coughs> if uh, x is pretty, then b is quiet. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yet, uh, what does line 20 say? So, so, okay, I should have asked you, you know, which then of the lines 19 and 20 does this line 21 star conflict with? And I think the answer is line 20, right? 21, ultimately, in disguise, is really a 21 star. 21 star says, for all x, and I, I could even, you know, go this kind of one more step if you want, um, that uh, sort of, uh, for all x, if x is pretty, b is quiet. That's what line 21 is really saying. For all x, if x is pretty, b is quiet. Now, it doesn't really say that. It says that there is not an x which is uh, pretty and yet b is not quiet. But, of course, that's just the same thing, right? If you sort of think that through sort of more carefully, that's just the exact same thing uh, in disguise. But now, not in disguise, I can see kind of clearly that line 20 says that there is not such a person. All right, line 20 says it's not the case that there is a person with this property that uh, for everyone who's pretty, that person is quiet. And yet, here I have a clear case right here, which is this line, uh, which is this line 21. And so, I want everyone to feel that this line 21, in disguise, directly contradicts line 20. And in fact, the whole proof now is, is just kind of done, right? What am I going to do? I am going to uh, use 21 to contradict line 20. Uh, and so the form that my contradiction is going to take right now is uh, that uh, there exists a y such that for all x, um, not p of x uh, or q of y, and uh, the negation, which is line 20, not there exists a y for all x, not p of x, uh, or q of y. And uh, sort of, uh, uh, why, where, where am I going to get that from? Well, I'm going to get that by proving that there does exist a y uh, such that for all x, not p of x uh, or q of y. And then I'm going to uh, end it together with line 20. And what is, how am I going to prove this y? Well, in fact, it's going to be just b itself. In other words, I'm going to prove for all x, not p of x, uh, or Q of B. I'm going to prove that, uh, well, in fact, what, I'm gonna, what is this line that I just wrote right now? It's just 21 star. In other words, <clears throat> this entire uh, rest of the work I have to do uh, consists in me just uh, showing that my actual line 21 leads to line 21 star. And uh, line 21 star asserts that uh, B has this uh, certain property that uh, for everyone who's pretty, B is quiet. Um, but that means that there is someone with that property, and that contradicts line 20, and then this whole proof is done. Okay, uh, so I just to get from, from 21 to this, to this line that I was calling 21 star, how am I going to do that? Well, uh, and now maybe I can erase this, uh, this sort of uh, scratch work uh, thinking that was going on over here. And, uh, okay, well, I think I know what to do because this is a universal. And so since this is a universal, I'm going to do a universal proof. So, in other words, I uh, take some arbitrary object A 
and I need to prove about A that uh, A is not pretty or B is uh, quiet. And if I can <coughs> prove it uh, about A, well, then uh, it will hold sort of for every, I need all my space here, uh, I will prove it uh, there for about, um, about every object, right? If I can prove it from A, uh, based on, about A, based on nothing, then in fact it holds for every object. Okay, uh, how am I going to prove that statement? Well, uh, there's only one good way to prove a disjunction, uh, and that is, again, by contradiction. I'm certainly not going to be able to prove that it's just one or the other of these, and so I have to start my fourth straight uh, proof by contradiction, or it's not really the fourth one, because 19 isn't a proof by contradiction, but... Uh, so uh, now up here in line 22, I say, okay, suppose it's not the case that not P of A uh, or uh, Q of B, and I'm going to get a contradiction, and then I'll be able to say not, not uh, P of A or, sorry, not, 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 not P of A or Q of B. Zone. Okay, so now with four negations, I think I can finally do this proof. Uh, how? Uh, well, uh, ultimately, uh, what's it going to take to, wait, I think I'm doing this right. Um, yeah. Is that what I want to do next? Uh, maybe I don't need to do that by contradiction. No, I guess I do. Um, yeah, okay, so, so, okay, so I still, there's still a little bit of thinking left here. <coughs> Um, but we're, we're almost down to the level of propositional logic. Uh, how am I going to get this contradiction? What does 22 say? Um, 22, uh, sort of, okay, okay, once again, maybe I will do some sort of scratch work or something, because what does 22 really say? By using the regular propositional logic de Morgan laws, 22 really says uh, P of A and not uh, Q of B. And what's wrong with P of A and not Q of B? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. If P of A and not Q of B, then line 21 says, yeah, but there just doesn't exist an X that has that property, and yet A has that property. And so uh, you should see 22 as contradicting line 21. And uh, basically, uh, if I can just prove sort of down, uh, well, I'm basically going to get, here's, here's how this is going to go. If I'm doing like sort of full outside in, then the contradiction is going to come from showing that there exists an X such that P of X uh, and not Q of B, and there does not exist an X such that P of X and not Q of B, boom, boom. Uh, and where's that going to come from? Well, it's going to come from proving that there is indeed this uh, X such that, boom, and then I'm going to uh, and uh, that line uh, together with, with 21, and where am I going to get this? Well, I'm going to actually just prove, uh, you know, P of A uh, and not Q of B. And if I can prove P of A and not Q of B, you know, sort of, sort of then I'm, I'm done. Uh, okay, and how am I going to do this? Oh man, I think I really am going to run out of space. Well, I'm going to just go really small here. Uh, how, sh how should I prove this uh, conjunction? Well, I'm just going to do it one at a time with two little mini proofs by contradiction. So over here, uh, line 23, writing very small, I shall imagine my goal is to prove P of A after all. So let's imagine not P of A. Okay, well, if A is not pretty, then I simply or on to that Q of B. But that is a contradiction, because uh, not P of A or Q of B contradicts line 22. So I have not uh, P of A or Q of B and not not P of A or Q of B, Jean, bottom. Therefore, 27, 
not, not P of A, 28 P of A. And what now? Uh, now I sort of do it again. In line 29, I suppose, uh, I want to show not Q of B, so just suppose Q of B, and then or on a not P of A onto the front of it, Q of B, well, okay, and now I think, what am I? I'm like, just going to fit this. Um, do I have this right, uh, line-wise? Yeah. So, uh, then this is uh, not P of A or Q of B and not uh, not P of A or Q of B. And that is a bottom, therefore not Q of B. Oh my gosh. There it is. 34, 35, 36, 37, and okay. So, it looks like an hour um, or something. Um, this is my second time in 24 hours recording this video, believe it or not. Um, 49 and 50. Um, and uh, I think this explanation went kind of a lot better. Uh, let's fill in all the justifications because I'm afraid I haven't done that. So, all right, uh, well, that's my sort of first step that isn't an assumption is line 24, sort of like the sixth line or eighth line or something into this thing. What's going on in line 24? Uh, well, that's just an or intro from line 23. Fact. Uh, line 25 is just an and intro from the previous line 24 and line 22. That's uh, therefore a bottom. Uh, line 25 is a contradiction. Uh, then I have negation intro 23 through 26. Because uh, I did a proof by contradiction, 23 led to a bottom. Then I eliminate the negation, so negation elim 27. Great. That's one of my uh, two propositions I needed. Now I go ahead and do the other one, so assume Q of B. Now uh, I or on, so or intro, uh, line 29, I or on P of A, to the, not P of A, to the front of it. Now I have an and intro, uh, that line, line 30, and uh, the, the line 22, which was the big, uh, the big problem, the thing I'm trying to show is false. Well then that gives me a bottom intro, uh, from because 31 is a contradiction. All right, I assume Q of B, I got a contradiction, therefore not Q of B, so negation intro um, 29 through 32. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now I and together the two things that I proved uh, separately uh, in uh, those two little subproofs, those two proofs by contradiction, 28 and uh, 33. And what's wrong with that? Well, uh, I've shown some fact about A. Now I sort of weaken that assumption by uh, generalizing to just saying that there exists some object with, which has the property that, that A has. Uh, so that's existential, uh, existential intro 34. And in that form, uh, we have a contradiction with line 21. So, and intro, the previous line, 35. And... Um, and 21. Therefore, a bottom, uh, bottom intro 36. Okay, what just happened? A whole bunch of uh, mostly uh, propositional logic, but the big idea was that in line 22, I began a proof by contradiction, and it led to a bottom. So 22 to 37, uh, which means I stick a bottom in the front. Now I um, eliminate that double negation in line 38. Okay, uh, well, starting from nothing, I proved some fact about A, so therefore that uh, fact holds about any object whatsoever. So I say universal intro 22 through 39. Then I, once again, uh, existential intro, I introduce uh, an existential, 
uh, I proved some fact about B in line 40. Now I simply say that there is some object uh, with that property, so existential intro uh, 40. Uh, why? Well, in that form, this line 40 contradicts line 20. So I have X is, uh, sorry, line 41 and 20. Uh, and intro 41 and 20. Yup, that is a bottom. So bottom intro 42. And okay, uh, I was actually in the middle of doing a gigantic proof by contradiction, which started um, up in, uh oh. Oh yeah, sorry, it started in line 21. Um, man, I lost track of my business for a second, yeah. Uh, uh, it started in line 21, I assumed something, and uh, that led me uh, to a bottom in line 43, so I stick a negation in front. Now, once again, a double, another double negation elimination uh, of line 44 it gives me this uh, thing I want, and uh, okay, what is this thing I want? It's a statement about a B, but if I proved it from nothing, then uh, by universal intro, I have in fact proved something more general about any object Y. So that's uh, 21 through 45. That was line 46. And then, um, well, just no. Because, um, sorry, line 46, when I add you, to line 19, I get a contradiction. Bottom, intro, uh, 47. Thus, uh, I started up at the very top uh, a proof by contradiction in line 20, and it did finally in line 48 lead to a bottom, and if I eliminate that final negation, uh, then I get the, the, the right half of the thing I was trying to prove. And then, uh, okay, the final uh, line, which I didn't have space for, didn't feel like writing, is just the statement of the biconditional, so in fact this proof is 51 lines. Okay, hopefully that was pretty good and uh, worth it. Uh, if you watched the whole thing, congratulations. Uh, coming up uh, next will be uh, proofs, uh, me for, with me wearing a different shirt, will be uh, proofs uh, 47 and 40. Woo, goodbye. Okay, we're back with proof number 47. Um, this is kind of an interesting one, and this is a follow-up on some things we did at the very beginning of our um, education on predicate logic, which is the one of the great things you can do with predicate logic is you can express yourself uh, more completely uh, by, um, uh, well, you can use the quantifiers and variables to uh, sort of say things like, uh, there is exactly one object with a certain property. This is, of course, something you, you can't do in, in, um, in propositional logic. So uh, we did a bunch of these uh, so-called translations where we took sentences in English and we um, tried to, assuming that these sentences were unambiguous, we tried to express them uh, in the sort of absolutely unambiguous language of predicate logic. And uh, one of the translations that we did was, um, well, what I just said, that there is exactly one object with property P. And this was our translation. We said, if there is exactly one object uh, with property P, uh, well, what does that mean to say that there's exactly one? It means that there's at least one and that there's only one. Uh, so uh, what, what we said was, okay, well, first off, there exists some object which really does have that property. And no one else has that property, and one way to express that no one else has that property is to say that, well, for any other object that does have that property, it's just the same object x again. In other words, there can't be a uh, uh, maybe uh, almost more natural way of, uh, of expressing this is, is with the contrapositive. Um, so the contrapositive of p of y implies x equals y is that if x is not equal to y, then not p of y. Um, so, uh, uh, x has property P, and for every other object that's not x, it doesn't have that property. Uh, okay, so if you like that better, you know, that's fine, but uh, anyway, this is certainly uh, a good translation of that um, statement, that there's exactly one P. We also uh, looked at um, uh, translations of, of ways of saying, you know, that there aren't two objects with property P. 
And of course, that's what this says over here, right? This says that there does not exist uh, two objects which both have property P and also that they're they're different. Uh, and so this entire sentence can be uh, can be interpreted as saying uh, that uh, if there is exactly one object with property P, then there are not two distinct objects with property P. <coughs> okay, so this is intuitively valid. Uh, let's see if we can prove that this is true with a Fitch style proof, which also makes maybe makes us um, more confident in our translation or something. I don't know. Uh, anyway, this is I think not hard uh, this problem, but it does it is sort of new. Uh, uh, it's kind of got some new stuff in it. Okay, first of all, uh, a couple little notes. Uh, one is that um, you know x this this not equals y is not really a symbol of our of our language. It's really a shorthand um, for not uh, x. It's just a shorthand for this. So you might be wondering why I'm using this shorthand, because in general, we take no shortcuts uh, with these fish style proofs. So, I don't know, I considered maybe doing it like this, but that's just sort of more annoying with no added benefit. So uh, don't, if you want to rewrite this entire proof, um, and, uh, and without, without using this extra not equal symbol, you know, feel free to do so. Um, another thing is that, uh, you know, part of predicate logic has equality built into it. Um, and uh, so, so um, we want to be able to sort of handle things like, you know, substitutions and things like that. So um, there are some principles governing equality, and basically equality is an equivalence relation. So it's symmetric, uh, sorry, reflexive, symmetric, and, and transitive. So we, we did invent these rules, which we sort of build into the very logic itself. What are the rules says? that you can just assert with no warning uh, that, you know, anything is, is equal to itself. This is the reflexive property of equality. We had another rule sort of buried in the packet somewhere that uh, if A equals B, then B equals A. So there might be some sort of technical reason why you want to write it in the opposite direction you should be entitled to. This is sort of a basic property of equality, and so our system should reflect that. And then the transitive property um, says that if A equals B and B equals C, uh, then uh, we may just sort of conclude uh, that A equals C. That's, and, and our justification is, you know, transitive property of equality. Okay, so these are fairly intuitive enough that I think uh, having just mentioned them now, we'll, we'll use them uh, when we need to. Okay, let's, let's do the proof. Uh, in some ways you can just kind of go and it will just work. So, all right, let's, let's go. Um, what is this proof? Of course, it's a conditional. So I will uh, assume up here in line one that there exists an x uh, such that p of x and for all y, uh, if p of y, then x equals y. And brackets, great. Uh, and uh, I need to prove this statement way down here. Uh, that it's not the case that there exists an x and there exists a y such that p of x and p of y and x is not y. Okay, uh, well, um, there's really only one good thing to do, um, which is uh, a proof by contradiction, because the thing I'm trying to prove is a negation. So let's just do that. So here we go. Uh, in other words, up here in line 10, 2, I will suppose that there exists an x and such that there exists a y such that p of x and p of y uh, and x is not y. Okay, and now I'll have a contradiction. And by the way, down here, okay, I guess, you know, whatever. I guess I can just write this whole damn thing out again. I don't want to. P of x uh, and um, and for all y, need to get a new board. P of y plus x equals y. Sha. If that's all true, then arrow there exists no not um, not. Uh, there exists an x, there exists a y, such that p of x and p of y and x is not y. Okay. Cha, 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 cha. Great. Um, great, great, great. Okay, uh, well, I have now three existential statements, and somehow they have to all lead to a contradiction. All right, well, without further ado, let's just go. 
Lie one asserts the existence of a person, so it seems like the thing to do is to name that person. I shall name that person A. Uh, so what's true about um, this person A? Well, what's true about this person A is that they're sort of like the one with property P, and no one else has it. Uh, in other words, A has property P, and for all Y, uh, if um, Y has property P, then uh, A equals Y. Okay, uh, I think I need sort of both of those, so maybe I'll just, right now, just sort of do it, right? A has property P, uh, and uh, for all Y, um, if Y has property P, then A equals Y. Okay, and uh, my justification here for both of these is just and elim 3 and elim 3. Okay? Uh, right. Uh, how is this going to lead to a contradiction? Because line 2 says that there are these two other people that uh, both have this property and uh, yet they are not equal to each other. Oh. But line 5 tells me that everyone that has that property is basically A. Okay, so I think uh, already maybe this is just all kind of making sense. And now it's just a technical matter of, of making it all work. Um, but, all right, uh, line 2 asserts the existence of some person. So I will once again uh, do another existential Elin proof. So within this. So now I say, okay, well, line 2 says that there's this person X. Let's name them. So let's name them, I don't know, B. So I start a new proof, uh, and here in line six I say, okay, what, 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 um, okay, line two asserts the existence of a person, let's name that person B. So what's true about this person B? Uh, I mean, that's, it's that there exists a Y such that P of B uh, and P of Y and B is not Y. Chop. Okay, but... Uh, line 6, just like line 2, is an existential, and so I can't make any progress on analyzing or using line 6 without temporarily naming that person line 6 something. So I now start, like, again, inside here, like a third uh, existential elim proof, where I say, okay, you Y in line 6, I name you C. And so what's true is that P of B and P of C and B is not C. Uh, okay, and I want to show that these all lead to contradictions, do they? Yeah, they just do, because now let me just grab all three of these facts. Um, I know that, that um, B has property P. I know that C has property P. I also know that B is not C. And where did these all come from? All three of these came from and elim uh, line seven. Okay, uh, and now what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is this: is that there's this line five, which says that everyone that has this property is basically just a. Okay, so I now use line five uh, twice. Um, so on the one hand. By sticking B in for Y in line 5, I get that if B has property P, then A equals B. But on the other hand, I stick in C for line 5, and I'm told that if C has property uh, P, then A equals C. And both of these are just universal elim 5. Universal Elim 5. Okay. Um, but, of course, uh, it is true that B and C have, these, uh, ha have this property P. So now, in lines sort of 13 and 14, I uh, can just do modus ponens and I get that A equals B. Reason, arrow, Elim 11, 8. And here I get that A equals C, which is arrow, elim, uh, 12, and 9. Alright, I suppose this is what I did on my paper. Yeah, it just must have been. 
Okay. Um, well, I don't know. Anyway, now looking at the so what's what's kind of the problem with this? The problem is I have now sort of these three facts, right? That A equals B, that A equals C, and yet that B is not C. So now I'm down into the sort of very low level uh, facts about uh, equality. Okay, and here is where you might want to do this differently. Yeah, watch this. Um, because I want to use the uh, transitive property, uh, I have to do this little annoying move where I rewrite A equals B as B equals A. Okay, um, if you don't see why yet, you know, too bad. Um, but I'm just going to write a symmetric uh, property of, uh, of equality. And the symmetric property of equality is applied to, to line 13. So uh, this symmetric property of equality is just a rule of our logic. It's a rule governing uh, how equality works. And it says that if A equals B, then, then B equals A as well. Okay, well that's good because I also have a rule, the transitive property of equality. Transitive property of equality. And that is, uh, what is it? Um, it's line B, A, A, C, yeah. 15 and 14. So if you combine 15 and 14 together, the transitive property says if B equals A and A equals C, then B equals C. And so I conclude that B equals C. Uh, that just follows from uh, 14 and 15. B, if B equals A and A equals C, then B equals C. Okay, but now I also have that B is not C. So here in line 17, I have that B equals C and and perhaps now, maybe I'll, I'll sort of unshorthand this, if that makes some people feel better. Uh, all that while, you know, B is not equal to C was just shorthand for not B equals C. So this is just and intro um, 10 and 16. And that, of course, is a bottom. So uh, I'm just going to barely have enough space to squeeze this in. This is bottom intro. Uh, 17. And now what happened, uh, well what happened was uh, I, maybe this time I, I won't go through this whole explanation again because by now you either, you, you just have to get it. But uh, you know, when I started this, this subproof, I was using line 6. Line 6 asserted the existence of some person. I named that person temporarily C and from that I got a contradiction. And so this contradiction just holds. And the justification for this contradiction in line 19 is existential elim uh, 6 and 7 through 18. In other words, um, uh, line 6 asserted the existence of some person. I temporarily named that person C. I got a contradiction in line 18, so therefore uh, line 6 is, is contradictory. And again, uh, I also so, did that, how many more of these do I have? I guess that's it, right? Then I, wait a second, yeah. Then here in line 20, I now again assert a bottom. Reason, uh, existential elim. Now I had an existential, which was line two. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Line two, line two asserted the existence of some X. I chose to temporarily name that X, B, maybe this is kind of hard to see, I don't know. Uh, so in line, I took the existential in line two, that X in line two, I decided to, to call it B, starting up here in line six, and in uh, lines six through 19, uh, I explored what happens uh, if you name uh, that X in line two, B, and I got a contradiction, so that contradiction follows from, from line two. And finally, sounds like I'm repeating myself, um, this entire subproof starting above line three was really an exploration of line one. So in line one, I had an existential. I chose to call that uh, X A. And in lines three through 20, um, I explored that, uh, that, that line one and it led to a contradiction, so that contradiction just follows from line one. And now, uh, of course, uh, I have um, a bottom that I, that I got, uh, so I get this negation intro 
um, it started in line two, I assumed something in line two, and it led to a bottom, so in line 22 I conclude the negation, and then the justification for this is just arrow intro one through 22. Woo! Okay, that was uh, proof uh, 47. Uh, so maybe that was kind of kind of fun because it wasn't so hard. Uh, I think this explanation was good. Last proof. Um, last proof. All right. I, I sort of hesitate to do this one, you know, at all. Uh, this is proof number forty, and um, yeah, this is proof number forty. And okay, this is just some like weird. Um, this is a weird proposition, and. Uh, it's so weird that you might even think it's false. Uh, every year I have, you know, three or four students who come to me, you know, demanding uh, in anger that I, I, I kind of um, recant uh, my position and, and say that, in fact, uh, line 40, that this um, uh, proposition of line 40, they, they think it's false and that it made some kind of error and they have a counterexample or something. Um, so, uh, what is this line 40? Uh, and I, I regret uh, sort of putting it, maybe I regret putting it in the packet at all, maybe I regret, I certainly regret putting it in the packet in the spot that it is, uh, which is why um, I should probably just redo this whole packet and maybe maybe take out some stupid ones and add in some more practice for some hard things, but you know what, I don't want to. Uh, so, uh, Aaron, there exists an X such that, one second, uh, P of X arrow q of x. Okay, uh, and I guess these parentheses, I, I leave them out as often as I include them, so maybe I'll just leave them out. Okay, so uh, what does this say? It says, it basically says something like, you know, the arrow distributes over the exponential, or the exponential distributes over the arrow, or something like that. And um, you can see this line 40, uh, this proof 40 as being um, well, it's kind of the logical conclusion of, of, of the five proofs that came before it. All explore sort of like what are the properties that, that you can, um, well, if you just look at the, the five proofs leading up to this proof, you can see how this one is sort of goes with them in a, in a kind of a way. But it's really, really weird, uh, this, this proof and this statement. Before we even look at it, I want to sort of make some kind of comments, which is, uh, recall that, uh, well, our system is supposed to um, be a, a system for producing valid proofs, and so I have to convince you sort of that every rule of this system is intuitively uh, valid. Uh, so, you know, leads to valid in the sense that, you know, produces correct arguments, so when the premises are true, the conclusion is true, uh, and, um, well, uh, so, um, you know, the rules, the rules should sort of all, all reflect that. All right, well, we have to kind of worry about some weird special cases. And uh, so, so there are some weird special cases. Um, so for example, yeah, let me think this through a little bit. Um, so take, uh, I'm going to just sort of ask you, even though there's no one actually here, what do you think about the following proposition? There exists an x such that p of x or not p of x. All right. So there's uh, so you have some property p, and this proposition, pretty innocent, just says, hey, there's some object, and here's what property the object has. Um, either it has property p or it doesn't. Okay, this feels a lot like a tautology. Um, in fact, it sort of superficially has the form, you know, P or not P. Um, and, uh, you know, either, you want to say, uh, this is true or this is not true. And so, um, in fact, uh, any object whatsoever in your domain, regardless of what, your, um, of what P means, and regardless of what your domain is, if there's any object in your domain whatsoever, then uh, that object, that arbitrarily chosen object, will satisfy this property. Okay, and so you're tempted to say that this is a tautology. 
And, um, and yeah, it just is a tautology. And uh, it is a tautology, we sort of want it to be a tautology, it's good if this is a tautology. Um, but the one thing, uh, especially the way I just phrased this right now, you might be thinking is, what if there are just no objects? So if my domain of discourse uh, is empty, if there are no objects in the whole world, then this is uh, not true. Okay, this is sufficiently, this state of affairs is sufficiently sort of distasteful uh, to, to everyone that we don't, we don't want this. So kind of by default, um, we just assert uh, in standard, for, uh, standard predicate logic, I'll just call it still for now, uh, that, um, that we don't uh, allow for empty domains. Uh, because uh, allowing for empty domains doesn't really gain us any extra power, it just makes a lot of things kind of annoying, it brings in a lot of annoying special cases and there's all of your sort of theorems about the way logic works now suddenly have to have this extra proviso like if the domain is not empty, so that just sucks. So we just, uh, we're just going to assert that all our domains are, are non-empty. Uh, and then, uh, this is a tautology, uh, and then everything is great. Okay, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, how would you prove uh, such a thing? Um, well, uh, it's kind of a strange thing to prove in our system, actually, um, because what you want to, to do is to sort of take any object whatsoever, and yet, um, I don't know what the objects are, or, or whatever. And so, um, you have to do this, to, to prove something like this, you have to do this thing that um, doesn't happen uh, anywhere else in this packet, and, and I should probably consult with some experts even, because I'm not positive that this is a totally standard uh, thing to do right now, but anyway, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I, I claim this can be proved from nothing. How? Well, you just immediately start talking about some object. So, uh, I'm going to call this object A, and uh, what I'm going to do about this object is I'm... Yeah, crying baby. I'm going to assume that uh, P or not P is false about this object A. Uh, now, you might be kind of bewildered now and thinking, well, what the hell is A? Good question. Uh, it doesn't matter. The best answer to what is A is don't worry about it too much. Uh, A is not uh, some temporary name. Uh, A, nor, neither is A an arbitrary name. A is just some object from my domain of discourse that I just begin immediately talking about for no particular reason. Uh, okay, well, uh, I don't think we need to necessarily rehash this this uh, argument from, from propositional logic, but, you know, I don't know, we, we could or something if you want, uh, that, that you, you know, you suppose A, but then, you suppose A has property P, but then you or on uh, this, but then, you know, then, then, then that's, um, some of you are very familiar with this uh, proof, because you sort of do it over and over again, you know, da, 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 and then that leads to a bottom, and then that means the not P of A, um, hold on, this is going somewhere, uh, but then you or on P of A again to that, hopefully this is legible, but then you get another thing where you're like, nah, nah, nah. so then now that is a bottom, and then you get the not not of it, and then down here, what do you get uh, finally in line 10, you get uh, the, thing, the thing that you wanted, right? Um, uh, P of A or not P of A. In other words, everything up until now has been has been uh, propositional logic. Um, but now in this final line, remember, the goal is to prove that thing up there. I just now say, okay, well, let me abstract away from A. And now A sort of like disappears. And we just say, uh, we just say this. Okay, and this is the thing we tried to prove. And this just is a, a sort of a tautology, as long as your domain of discourse is not empty. Anyway, uh, the strange kind of move, I think, uh, that what, what makes this proof that we just did strange is, is this statement right here, uh, where we just begin talking about A sort of for no reason. This comes up again. Um, maybe you want to have, maybe you consider the following uh, statement. Uh, if everybody uh, is pretty, then somebody is pretty. All right, if I say this real fast and don't give you too much time to think about it, uh, I think virtually everybody would agree that this is, of course, a tautology. Look, if everybody is pretty, then that means that somebody is pretty. 
Um, okay, but actually the people who were like uh, studying Aristotle in the Middle Ages were very befuddled by these kinds of things, and there were sort of all sorts of like annoying and complicated discussions about whether about whether this is actually a legitimate logic or not. But let's just agree that it is. When, when, what, for what, what could you possibly object to this? Well, potentially, if your domain of discourse is just empty, right? If there are no uh, objects, well, screaming baby. If there are no, if there are no objects with property P, then it's still a little bit controversial. But we've sort of moved beyond that, right? That the that the conditional uh, is going to be vacuously uh, true um, if if this is false. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, if I, wait. What did I say? Uh, if everyone is pretty, then someone is pretty. So, uh, yeah, the only way this could be false is if this were true and this false. And you're probably thinking, how could that possibly be? How could everyone be pretty and yet there not be someone who's pretty? Um, well, the only way for that to be true is if there are just no objects. If there are no objects whatsoever in the domain of discourse at the OBO, then... Um, then a um, universal statement becomes kind of vacuously true about them. And this is just kind of stupid. Uh, we, we want it to be, we, we don't like saying that everyone is pretty. Uh, I mean, take this as your world. The world is, there are just no people whatsoever. Then is it true or false that everyone is pretty? Well, I guess technically it's true because um, at some very, very low level, uh, you know, take any person whatsoever, <laughs> then they are pretty. Well, there just are no people. So it's sort of then it automatically is true or something like that. Um, so, uh, okay, we don't like this. Uh, and so once again, um, we just demand that our domain be uh, non-empty. So we don't have to deal with this. Uh, and so, okay, and so if we demand that our domain be non-empty, and we do demand this, and I demand this, and we all agree that this is just what we're going to do, well, then this becomes uh, indeed a tautology. And then the proof of it is quite straightforward. I used to have this in the packet, but it confused people so much that I, I took it out uh, because, um, you know, it's, it's too weird of a proof to do sort of right away because what would you, what would you do now? Uh, you would say, uh, what would you say? Um, well, you have to just kind of, right now, similar to over here, you have to just now say, you have to just begin immediately talking about some person A. Who's A? Well, it doesn't matter. A is just someone from my domain of discourse, and I know my domain is not empty, so that means there is some person out there that I can just start talking about. And so I just start talking about A. And then, of course, uh, once you allow me to go from line one to line two, then I can just say that, that there, that, um, that there exists a person who's pretty, and now uh, A, is, a is sort of gone, and, and, and everything's okay. All right, so this was a very long-winded way of saying that, uh, that there are a, there's a certain sort of category of slightly controversial statements which uh, are intuitively tautologies, but mm, their tautological status requires that we, uh, that we think sort of carefully uh, about uh, the kinds of things we want to do with our logic, and um, we want uh, this to be a tautology and this to be a tautology, so we demand that our domains be not empty, and uh, if we are going to then uh, do proofs in our Fitch style system, uh, then I have to be, in order to be able to execute this proof, I need to be allowed to do this transition from line one to line two, which is to say, just stick something in there. Uh, what is A, you might be asking right now? Don't worry about it. What is A here? Don't worry about it. There is something in my domain, so, so everything works out. Okay. Um, and, uh, all right, now to get finally to number 40, uh, I talk about this because, uh, uh, of course, number 40 has this property. Um, so what's, what does this line, uh, what does this, this property, this proof 40 even say? It says, okay, uh, if this is a conditional and it's, a, you know, only going in one direction, so it's, if this is true, then this is true. Okay, what does this say? This says, if there exists a pretty person, then there exists a quiet person. If it's true that if there exists a pretty person, then there exists a quiet person, then there exists a person who, if they're pretty, then they're quiet. 
You can say this to yourself over and over again, uh, and maybe you have already, uh, trying to figure out what this means, and I think it's quite hard. Uh, I think maybe the best way to convince yourself that this is true is to try to falsify it. What would it mean for this to be false? Well, the only way for this conditional to be false is if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Okay, so let's just kind of uh, play for a minute uh, and say, all right, um, could this antecedent be true and this consequent false? It could be. Uh, what would it mean for this consequent to be false? Let's see, is this what I want to do? What would it mean for this consequent to be false? Oh, no, here we go. Uh, then we're going to break it down into sort of cases. The cases are, does there exist a pretty person or not? All right, well, if there exists a pretty person, then, since this antecedent is true, I'm attempting to falsify this statement, recall, and I'm gonna, it's gonna, that attempt is going to fail, and that's gonna convince me that proof, that the Proposition 40 is true. If there exists a pretty person, then, uh, then there must exist a quiet person. Uh, so, okay, great, so there exists a quiet person. But, if there exists a quiet person, then automatically, if there's a quiet person, then uh, that person satisfies if they're pretty, then they're quiet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> which is another way of saying, uh, look, if, if the, given the way we define the conditional, if for, I think I need the light on here, uh, that if you give me any uh, conditional, if the um, consequent is true, then the conditional is automatically true. So uh, if there is a, exists a pretty person, then there exists a quiet person, but if there exists a quiet person, then let's take that person, you know, call them whatever you want. Uh, hey, you quiet person. Well then, uh, hey, you quiet person, you know, is quiet, which means that this conditional is true about them, which means that they are one of the people. Uh, and so then this is just not false. Um, on the other hand, what if there just are no uh, quiet, pr uh, no pretty people whatsoever? Well, if there are no pretty people whatsoever, then um, then this conditional is vacuously true. So that is not maybe the greatest explanation. Let's uh, let's just jump into the proof. Um, but I warn you that, uh, okay, so if your domain of discourse could be empty, then this would be false. Um, because, um, because if your domain of discourse could be empty, this statement might be false. Because what if there are, let's see, how do we do this? Uh, well, this is just be, then, then this would just be false, um, you know, arrow false, because there exists an X would be false, there exists a Q would be false, so then the, the arrow would be then true, um, but uh, there just wouldn't be a person, X, because there just are no people at all, and so we would have true arrow false. So this, this, this statement is false in a, in a domain of discourse which is, um, which is uh, empty, but as we require that our domain of discourse be non-empty, then this is in, this is in fact a, a true statement. Uh, as a tautology, we can prove it. Uh, and it sort of uh, comes down to, um, well, okay, let's begin. Uh, uh, the way, and I, in the packet a couple of years ago, I changed it to give everyone kind of a, kind of a good place to start. Um, and uh, because I think this is sort of so, so controversial, so maybe you understood what I was talking about, and maybe you didn't, but, uh, all right, after you've watched this extremely long uh, build-up here, what am I doing? Um, there exists, uh, P implies there exists a Q, so I'm just kind of just going on autopilot for a minute here, and just stating what, um, so now there exists an X, uh, P of X implies Q of X, cha cha cha. And therefore, I shall conclude down here that um, there exists an X, P of X implies. What am I doing? Uh, sorry. Cha cha cha. Uh, implies uh, there exists an X, Q of X 
implies that there exists an x, p of x implies q of x. Okay, cha. Alright, well, uh, good. In other words, it's a conditional, so I set out to just prove it, and here it is. Okay, how uh, am I going to uh, prove this? Well, like, there's just no way to do this, right? Except by contradiction. So I'm going to do this by contradiction. So way up here, perhaps I need to, to write smaller. Um, uh, I need to uh, assume uh, way up here that this is false. So assume that it's not the case that there exists an x such that uh, p of x implies q of x. And here I will get a bottom and uh, ah, bottom and then not, not, there exists an x, p of x implies q of x. Okay. Okay, so this seems like a, like a good plan. Uh, after all, this is sort of just like the way to, to prove an existential. Uh, it's a tautology, often involves this kind of proof by contradiction. So sort of now what? Um, okay, now, yeah, as I said, sort of in uh, my, uh, and this is what is, uh, I think, very unintuitive, um, is the sort of very unintuitive thing to do now is to say, okay, suppose A is pretty. Now, this might be bewildering to you, like, well, what the hell does that even mean? Uh, well, who is A or something like that? Uh, yeah, and my answer is, once again, don't worry about it. My domain is not empty. Uh, in fact, I think I've convinced you pretty, pretty thoroughly that, um, that my domain must be not empty, otherwise this statement is not just not true. And uh, so there's got to be at least one object in my domain that I can talk about. So I just begin immediately talking about A. And I suppose that A is pretty. Well, what does, where does that get me? Well, if A is pretty, now this proof just kind of writes itself, right? Because if A is pretty, that means there exists an x such that x is pretty. I think this is what I want to do. So that's existential intro 3. Alright, well then I can just do a modus ponens with 1. Uh, and that gives me uh, uh, someone who is quiet. Uh, reason, arrow, elim, uh, 1 and 4. Okay, great. Uh, now what? Well, now I have this quiet person. Let's name them so that I may reason about them. Uh, and I will name them, I guess it doesn't matter, does it matter? I named them B, is this what I want to do? Yikes. This is just straight up not what I did in my packet at all. Uh, I wonder if this is also legit though. What am I doing? No, this is exactly what I did in my packet. P of an uh, What? Uh, hold on a second. I, I kind of just haven't really been... Well, I guess it doesn't matter. Does it matter? P of A... I guess it doesn't matter yet. Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter yet. Okay, so everything's still fine. I guess everything is still fine. This is totally not what I did in my packet, but I think this is still okay. Um, so let's let's call this person B. And what property does this person B have? They are uh, they're quiet. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm exploring line line five um, right now. Is what's happening. Okay, what's my what the hell am I trying to do again? I'm trying to get a contradiction, and uh, it's going to come from lines one and two. Notice I haven't proven line two yet. Um, I'm wondering whether I should backtrack or just push on. Um, maybe this would be a good time to have a plan. Um, yeah, my plan is going to be, give me one more second here, to think this through. Um, uh, what can I do? Sure, I think I can actually 
just get a contradiction right now. Yeah, but it's sort of weirder this way. Uh, it's kind of weirder this way. Uh, it's weirder this way. Um, so there does exist next. What the hell am I doing? P of X, so that I get a contradiction. So then that, 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 that leads to a contradiction. So the whole thing is contradictory, but um, that doesn't actually help me, or does it? Um, well, you know what? Uh, it's too late. I'm just going to keep on going forward because this is how I feel about this problem now. I just did it out of my head. I think it's going to work. Uh, so, okay, what, what's, what's true about this? Well, it's exactly what I said before, right? Uh, what I said before is that uh, if Q of B is true, then sort of, um, then P of B, arrow Q of B is true. In other words, here's what I now do. Uh, in line 7, I say suppose uh, P of B, and then I just read it, um, I read it uh, Q of B uh, right now. Uh, reason uh, for this, uh, reiteration, line 6, and I then uh, assert down here that uh, P of B implies Q of B. Uh, why? Uh, this is just arrow intro uh, 7 through 8. Okay, what just happened here? What just happened here was a little sneaky move in which I uh, took us from line 6 to line 9. Uh, if you're very comfortable with propositional logic, then there's nothing to fear here. Of course, if the consequent is true, then the conditional is automatically uh, kind of true. So I sort of, sort of weakened things by taking us from, from 6 to 9. But uh, 9 is what I want, because 9 uh, is a problem for this everything happening here. Because what do we get uh, out of this line uh, 10? Now I can say, well, that means there does exist an x. Uh, such that P of X implies uh, Q of X, and reason, uh, existential intro 9, um, which contradicts um, line 2. Uh, and so here it is, there exists an X such that uh, P of X arrow Q of X and um, there does not exist an x such that uh, p of x arrow q of x. This is just an and intro um, 2 and 10, 10 and 2. Okay, which gives me a bottom reason, you know, bottom intro um, uh, 11. So what, what just happened? Uh, well, what just happened is I just showed that the very existence, this is actually just completely, this way of doing proof is completely in line with the explanation I gave at the beginning before I started it. Uh, what I really just showed is that, uh, is that a bottom results from line 5. In other words, there can't be a quiet person, because if there's a quiet person, call them B, then B is quiet. Okay, well, if B is quiet, then uh, if P is if B is pretty, then B is quiet holds. But then there is a person who, if they're pretty, they're quiet, which contradicts line two. Uh, and so uh, that's just impossible. So what is this? This is an existential elim uh, line uh, five is the existential uh, statement that I'm eliminating, and I eliminated it in lines six through 12. Okay, great. Uh, I have a contradiction. So what? Um, I'm sort of doing this proof kind of without plan, uh, but uh, what did I just prove? I just proved that A is not pretty. Okay, so, so what? A is not pretty. What even is it, A? Well, I now do that whole move again. Um, and I don't have much room to do it in, but what I'm now going to do is I'm going to uh, show that now A violates line 2. Because, after all, now I'll start in line 15. This is not the most efficient way to do this, but maybe it's the most honest way to do this. Um, assume that A is pretty. But A is not pretty, of course. So now I assume in line 16 
that A is not quiet, uh, that A is not quiet, but then in lines 17 and 18, hopefully you see where this is going, this says that A is pretty and A is not pretty. This is a bottom. This brings me to not not Q of A, which brings me to, uh, which brings me to Q of A. In other words, what just happened is I just proved, okay, I just ran out of space. So this is a little bit of a disaster. Maybe I'll just fill it in by writing smaller. Um, what I just proved here is that in line 21 is that P of A does imply Q of A. Okay, in other words, um, what I have just done is, this is the only good way to do this, it's quite tedious, that if, if what I just showed is sort of that if A is not pretty, then, 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 uh, um, uh, What's the word again? Uh, it holds that, um, oh my god, um, uh, I'm blanking on the, the, uh, the word, but yeah, it's a um, vacuous is the word I'm looking for. Then it is vacuously true, this conditional, that if A is pretty, A is quiet, is vacuously true when A is just not pretty. And it just, it just took me, I don't think there was any faster uh, way uh, to do that, it just took me... Uh, all those lines to show that. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that, once again, I now have, in line 22, that there does exist an A, such that A is pretty and A is, um, sorry, there does exist an X such that if X is pretty, then, then um, X is quiet, which contradicts, it's going to take me two more lines to squeeze it in, I say, all right, there exists an x such that p of x implies q of x, and not there exists an x, um, p of x implies q of x, um, which is a bottom, which means that this whole thing is a bottom. Isn't, isn't that what I was trying to do? Yep. Uh, and so 25 and 26 happen right now, and 25 is just not not. Uh, there exists an x, uh, p of x implies q of x, and this is that there is one. There exists an x such that p of x implies q of x. Okay, what are all these justifications? Let's uh, do them quick. I'm kind of double checking as we go. I, I sort of did a bunch of them already. Um, it was only over here that I sort of stopped. Um, so I got this, this contradiction in line uh, 13. Where did line 14 come from? That was negation intro uh, lines uh, 3 through 13. Then I just did all this crazy stuff here. This was a negation uh, and intro, uh, 14 and 15. This is bottom intro, 17. This is negation intro, um, 16 through 18, followed by a negation elim, 19. Followed by an arrow intro. Oh man, arrow intro. Uh, tw fifteen through twenty, and finally, um, it's just hard to to write it in here. But there is a um, there is a right there existential intro. Line 21, and this is now and intro, um, 22 and 2, uh, followed by a bottom intro, uh, 23, followed by a negation intro, um, 2 through 24, followed by a negation elim, 25, and then uh, this whole proof, therefore, 
is 27 lines, arrow, intro, 1 through 26. I will say that on my paper I did it in 23 lines, so I did it in four fewer lines. And, uh, okay, but what I did on my paper was like almost too smooth. Um, so I can maybe show that uh, to you another time, but I think this is actually maybe the most clear way to do it, right? So, okay, great. Uh, you're done with this packet. Uh, goodbye.